Dark wings, dark words. I was only a boy when the Raven came to call my father, Lord Eddard Stark, to another war. Balon Greyjoy had raised the Iron Islands in revolt and burned the Lannister fleet at anchor. King Robert Baratheon again needed his old friend. My mother, Catelyn, was not happy to lose her lord husband to Robert again. Six years before, he had left her to avenge his father and brother against the Mad King. But now he had sons and daughters of his own, and, unspoken, another son who wasn't hers from the last time he went to war. My brother, Jon Snow. But she knew that in marrying my father, she had married the North. We hold our honor and duty as dear as our old gods. When the time came, my father marched south to restore peace and order to the realm. My father always told me the Iron Islands were a strange and dangerous place. Its people, the Ironborn, keep neither the old gods nor the Seven, and despise all honest toil. Their ancestors ravaged the western shores, raping and slaving and putting it to the torch, and their songs still ring through the halls of the Ironborn, while everywhere else, they are whispered to wayward children at bedtime. Perhaps Lord Balon thought Westeros had not healed from the war against the Mad King and was as fragmented and suspicious as the ancient kingdoms his forebears had terrorized. Robert's navy corrected him at Fair Isle when they smashed the Proud Iron Fleet. Robert and my father corrected him at Pike, his own castle, when they pulled down his towers and breached his walls. My father never liked to speak of his battles, but from other men I learned what transpired. Thoros of Mir was first through the breach with his flaming sword. Not far behind him was Jorah Mormont of Bear Island, my father's bannerman who earned the knighthood he would later shame, and lords from every corner of the Seven Kingdoms. All day, through every passage in the castle, they fought side by side, my father with our ancestral sword Ice, and King Robert with his war hammer against a horde of axe-wielding ironborn. In the end, Lord Balon bent the knee. King Robert generously allowed Lord Balon to retain his title and castle. The price of peace was custom. The only son of Balon's to survive his foolish rebellion would be taken as a hostage against future treasons. My father even volunteered to foster the boy himself, I suspect, to make Theon Greyjoy a different man than his father, who would bring honor and duty to the Iron Islands when he returned as heir. So my mother's silent fear came true, and my father returned with another child. Theon ate with us, played with us, and fought with us. Once the great bond between my father and Robert Baratheon united the realm against a mad king and brought him to justice for his crimes. Now, another monster sits on the Iron Throne, and another debt of blood is owed my family. Theon is my murdered father's ward. I am my murdered father's son. Like my father and Robert, bound in blood, if not by blood, we are brothers. When Aegon and his dragons burned Harren the Black and all his sons at Harren Hall, the days when men feared the sight of our long ships were over. Aegon would not permit marauders and raiders in his seven kingdoms. With Harren died our empire and the old way that forged it. But what is dead may never die. Six years after Robert Baratheon won his crown, my father, Balon Greyjoy, sought to restore our ancient rights. He declared the Iron Islands independent and himself its king and sent the Iron Fleet in a daring raid on Lannisport where they burned the Lannister ships at anchor, making us unchallenged in the Sunset Sea. This was the seed of our undoing. My eldest brother Roderick led a frontal assault on Seaguard, a town built to protect the mainland from us. After ferocious fighting beneath the city walls, he was slain by Lord Jason Malister and his men defeated. By this time, Stannis Baratheon had brought Robert's fleet around Westeros and somehow managed to trap the Iron Fleet at Fair Isle, smashing it. Robert's victory was now all but assured, yet we made him bleed for each island. Stannis Baratheon captured Greatwick, the largest of the Iron Islands, and Sir Barristan Selmy himself subdued Old Wick. Robert and Lord Eddard Stark led the main assault against the island of Pike.
They razed the town of Lordsport to the ground before Robert turned his full fury on our family's stronghold. When they breached the walls, the first through was Thoros of Mere with his ridiculous flaming sword, followed by every minor lord of Westeros hungry for glory. My other brother Maron was killed when the siege engines brought down a tower on his head. I was now my father's only living son, an heir to the Iron Islands. When my father saw his cause was lost, he wisely conceded defeat to Robert, who otherwise would have pulled down our castle stone by stone with us in it. As my father said to me then, no man has ever died from bending his knee. He who kneels may rise again, blade in hand. He who will not kneel stays dead, stiff legs and all. As it stands, Robert allowed my father to keep his lands and title as Lord of the Iron Islands, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, Lord Reaper of Pike, for a price. His last son and heir shipped off to Winterfell as an honoured guest. I would eat at the Stark's table and play with the Stark children. And if my father rebelled again, Lord Eddard Stark would take his sword and cut off my head. It would be his duty. Though Robert had risked all our lives to win it, the Iron Throne bored him. He cared little for justice, and less for rule. If it weren't women or wineskin, he had no use for it. Without the stalwart John Arryn as Hand of the King, the challenge to Robert's crown would have come much earlier than it did. The Iron Islands have never lacked for treachery. They respect only strength, and honor is as foreign to them as the Seven. After six years, their ruler, Lord Balon Greyjoy, wagered that King Robert had not won the support of the great houses of Westeros, many of whom still named him Usurper. Lord Balon declared the Iron Islands independent and sent his Iron Fleet to Lannispor. Lord Tywin Lannister was careless, and the Ironborn caught and burnt his ships at anchor. Lord Balon and his reavers controlled the Sunset Sea. Robert then ordered me to succeed where his father-in-law, Lord Tywin, had failed. Beneath Robert's fury, I sensed relief. War he could understand. He would smash Lord Balon as he had Rhaegar. I raised Robert's fleet and sailed around Westeros to the Iron Islands. I set a trap for the Iron Fleet off Fair Isle. As sailors and warriors, the Ironborn are unparalleled, but they're not soldiers. They have no discipline, no strategy, no unity. In a battle, each man fights only for his own glory, and their longships are built for lightning strikes and shore raids. When the captains rushed in, I smashed their longships with our larger war galleys. The strength of the Ironborn is in their ships. With the Iron Fleet broken, I had assured Robert's victory. He could now transport troops and siege weapons to invade the Iron Islands. And contrary to Balon's hopes, Robert had plenty of both. I've never seen such allegiance as Robert could inspire in war. Enemies who tried to kill him one day would be drinking with him the next under their own fallen banners. In rebelling against the Iron Throne, Lord Balon did more than Robert ever could to cement his rule. When Robert came to the Iron Islands, he brought with him the full power of Westeros. Sir Barristan Selmy of the King's Guard led the assault on Old Wick, while I subdued Great Wick, the largest of the Iron Islands. But Robert saved the seat of House Greyjoy, Pike, for himself and Lord Eddard. Robert would later boast of the battle's bloodiness and how he could have torn down the island into the waves if Lord Balon hadn't bent the knee. But if I'd have led the assault, Balon's neck would have bent, under his sword. Because I do not forget, I do not pardon. His time will come, all their times will come. My brother Robert Baratheon had raised the banners of Storm's End, our ancestral castle, against the mad King Aerys. 
John Arryn of the Vale and Eddard Stark of the North stood with him, and Hoster Tully of the Riverlands would join. But their lands were far from ours, and separated by the combined strength of the West, the Reach, and King's Landing itself. Even Robert's own lords were against him. It was the hardest choice I've ever made, my brother or my king, blood or honor. Ares ruled by right of all the laws in Westeros. Everyone knew the price of defiance, but there are deeper, older laws. The younger brother bows before the elder. I followed Robert. Early in the war, Mace Tyrell's indecisive victory at Ashford cut Robert off from Storm's End. Instead of pursuing Robert and risking his record, Mace Tyrell turned east and laid siege to our home. His vast army and navy encircled us and prevented any resupply by land or sea. If a wagon tried to reach us, it was burnt. If a ship tried to land, it was sunk. We were locked in Storm's End to starve, but Robert commanded me to hold the castle no matter the cost. He could ill afford to lose his ancient seat, which had never fallen. While Robert smashed Rhaegar on the Trident, my men ate the dogs, because the horses had already been devoured. While the Lannisters sacked King's Landing, we ate the rats. If the smuggler Davos had not slipped through the Tyrell blockade with his onions, we'd have eaten our own dead. But I held the castle until Lord Eddard remembered us and marched to lift the siege. The Tyrells didn't even put up a fight. And Robert threw a feast to celebrate Lord Eddard's victory. I was sent to the Royal Island stronghold of Dragonstone to deal with Viserys and Daenerys, the last surviving Targaryen children. Before I arrived, however, they escaped across the narrow sea. Robert was furious. He stripped me of Storm's End and gave it to that prancing fool Renly, my younger brother. I could keep Dragonstone. Now Robert is dead, and a bastard pretender soils my throne while the realm fills with schemers and traitors. But the rightful king is coming for them all, and I will not stop until I have scoured this land clean of abomination. The Baratheons say, ours is the fury. I will show them. Fury burn. In King's Landing, if you leave the Red Keep and aren't careful, you may find yourself in Flea Bottom. In such a cesspool, did House Seaworth have its glorious start. I got out as soon as I could, finding work on a smuggler's ship. Soon, every port on the Narrow Sea had a bounty on me, which they would collect if I didn't pay a percentage to the right people or pick the right tides. You know how to tell a good smuggler, when you talk to one, there's a head that talks back. I was very good. Davos of Flea Bottom had run with orphans and beggars, but Davos the Smuggler was received by merchants and lords when nobody would catch them. Oddly, the only honest work came from pirates like the notorious, bloodthirsty Salador Sam, an old friend. All he ever wanted was someone to buy his cargo quickly before the tide left and sell it without telling where I got it. In time, I saved enough to buy a small plot of land and found a woman who was kind enough to overlook my trade. She gave me a son, Mathos. And we dreamt of the trader's circle round the Jade Sea, just one trip and I could settle us and our family for life. Then some storm lord revolted against the Iron Throne. Wars are not as good for smugglers as you'd think. Every harbor fills with guards and inspectors, and the seas filled with blockades and pirates paid by each side to prey on the other. Though I had no love for the Mad King, I'd grown up around the power of King's Landing. I figured this Robert Baratheon would end the same as the other rebel lords, burnt to ash, but he didn't. The North, the Riverlands and the Vale joined him. And in the taverns, people drank to Robert's health openly. Brave fools, I thought. 
But I had a family who'd be left in the cold if I lost my head. When Mace Terrell marched on Robert's home of Storm's End, that's by the end of the rebellion, the castle was garrisoned by Robert's younger brother Stannis and a small guard, and would not hold out for long. When it fell, Robert would be homeless, and his support would bleed away. This I knew from experience. Months later, Stannis was still holding the castle. Nobody cared. But on voyages, I had seen what famine does, and I thought of all those men in Storm's End who would die unmourned and forgotten. No better than flea-bottom orphans. I told my wife and myself that I'd get a high price for the onions and salt beef. In truth, I knew I'd be captured by the Tyrell galleys or drowned, but I was too stubborn. Later that night, in the dark, in a tiny boat with a black sail, I cursed myself and the moonlight as I waited for the tide to turn. When it did, the wind beat the sail so hard I ripped it down, fearing the Tyrell ships would hear. Luckily, they had grown lax. With muffled oars alone, I steered my cargo through the treacherous currents and snarls of rock that give Shipbreaker Bay its name. The waves finally carried me, soaked and near blind from sea water, through the mouth of the cavern beneath the castle. Then, Stannis Baratheon arrived. The siege had left him gaunt, but not weak, never weak. He greeted me and accepted my onions with cool courtesy, betraying no emotion, even as all wept. He doled out the food to his wife and each of his men before he ate himself, a portion no larger than any other. When he finally thanked me, I could see his mind had already returned to the castle's defense. His duty. After Ares fell and Lord Stark lifted the siege, Stanna summoned me. For my salvation at Storm's End, I was to be granted a knighthood, a keep of my own, and my son taken into Stannis's personal service. Davos of Flea Bottom had become Sir Davos of House Seaworth, and his son would serve the king's own brother. But for my previous crimes as a smuggler, I was to have the fingertips of one hand taken off above the highest joint. Stannis held that I had flouted the laws of the land for years, and a good act does not wash out the bad. In one fell swoop, or five, Stannis gave my son a future and my family a name that I could never have imagined, nor earned on my own. I still keep the finger bones in a bag around my neck to remind me what I was and what I owed to Stannis. For due to my many years as a smuggler, I visited many ports, taverns, and back alleys, and saw many things in this world that never justice until Stannis. Some great houses call us upstarts, but the truth is that while the Starks and Lannisters fell to the Targaryens in defeat, House Tyrell rose. For thousands of years, our family served as loyal stewards to the Kings of the Reach, until the last of their line unwisely burned to death, resisting the Targaryen invaders. To save the Reach from a similar fate, we yielded the castle of Highgarden to Aegon and his sisters. In gratitude, the Targaryens gave House Tyrell dominion over the Reach. And we became lords of the castle in which, for generations, we had served. Under the Targaryen dynasty, Westeros prospered. Gone were the petty wars of seven kingdoms and the endless thirst for minor glories that drove them. The Westerlands enriched the realm. The North guarded it, and the Reach and Riverlands fed it. This harmony is what Robert Baratheon shattered with his rebellion against Ares Targaryen. When the call to arms came, though, we did not want to answer. The Reach is a gentle land, and honestly, the Mad King was not much love. But we owed peace and status to his family. My father, Mace Tyrell, called his banners and marched north to battle the rogue Stormlord Robert, who had already defeated three forces in a single day. And, at Ashford, my father won. 
Some chastened my father for not pursuing Robert after the battle. We had cut him off from the Stormlands, the seat of his power, and he had fled north, within easy grasp of Lord Tywin Lannister, the Hand of Ares, for twenty years. My father moved instead to lay siege to Robert's ancestral stronghold of Storm's End. The rose would strangle the stag as the lion pounced. So we waited. But the lion slumbered, and Robert slipped past the king's forces to join Ned Stark. We could have lifted the siege and deployed our armies north to aid the crown. We could have stormed the walls of the castle and made Robert homeless. But we had ample supplies, control of land and sea, and most of all, patience. Our siege would succeed, eventually, at little cost of life to us. If Robert prolonged the war with minor victories, our capture of Storm's End would hasten his downfall. And if Robert won the war, well, it would not do for him to find us in his halls with the bodies of his brother Stannis and his sworn men. When the Lion finally showed his colors and purged King's Landing, we knew our cause was lost. My father chose the peaceful route and bent the knee to Robert, who heartily pardoned us. Strange, considering how we'd beaten him and starved his brother to the brink of death. We were to keep our lands, castle, and title, but we knew that we would never be welcome at court. It didn't matter. The Reach was still the most fertile of the Seven Kingdoms, and under our hand. Every flower, even the rose, needs pruning. Then it grows strong. Family, duty, honor. Every Tully child learns our words, but I was a woman before I understood them. Years before, my father had taken to foster the son of a wartime friend, a minor lord on the fingers. The boy had arrived at our castle as Peter Baelish. Due to his home and size, my brother soon named him Littlefinger. When I came of age, Brandon Stark of Winterfell sought and won my hand. To my father, Brandon was heir to the North and a suitable match for a daughter of House Tully. To me, Brandon was wild and terrifying, never far from laughter or trouble. I loved him with all the fire of a first passion, much I came to realize as Peter loved me. When Peter heard of my engagement, he challenged Brandon to a duel. Peter survived only because I begged Brandon not to kill him. I still thought of Peter as family. Now, I wish I had let him die. Only days before my wedding when I thought to be happy forever, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen abducted Brandon's sister, Lyanna. Hot-blooded as always, Brandon immediately rode for King's Landing to demand justice, which the Mad King Ares Targaryen gave him in his own twisted fashion. The day the Raven arrived with the news of my Brandon's death, I locked myself in a room and refused to eat for days, until my father reminded me of my duty. I was to marry Eddard, Brandon's younger brother, a man whom I had never met, though of whom none spoke ill or spoke anything at all. Our union would cement an alliance of the North Vale, Stormlands, and Riverlands in rebellion against the Mad King. I was a Tully. I did my duty. We were married quickly, and were spared only one night before he had to return to the field. I spent the war by the windows waiting for a raven to hear if my son would grow up fatherless or at all. We knew the price of defeat. I scoured the kitchens and washing rooms for any and all gossip. Robert had won and crushed the Mad King. Robert had lost, but Jaime Lannister was now king. Robert had almost won, but the Mad King had become a dragon and burned King's Landing to ash. At night, 
I told myself the war would end soon and bring peace. Either a victory or the grave. I was wrong. Robert won, and my husband avenged his brother and my love. But when he came home to me, he could not meet my eyes. I saw the reason by his side. Many men have bastards, I know. And under the strain of war, any man, no matter how honorable, may forsake his vows for a night of warmth that he may never know again. But Ned Stark was not built like other men. His northern honor would not let him sequester his shame in some distant holdfast. He brought this boy, this Jon Snow, home to raise with his true-born children. My children. Yet even these bitter memories are sweet now. They are all I have left of my Ned. Our family is broken and scattered. And our son must wage a war for the pieces. We need to go home. The Starks are of the north and, like the snows of winter when they come south, they melt away. How's Tyrell trace our descent to Garth Greenhand, the legendary first King of the Reach who made the land bloom? But so too does every noble house around us. It seems dear ancestor Garth planted as many flowers as he plucked. A king should have more consideration for his line, don't you think? For over a thousand years, the Greenhand sons and grandsons ruled the Reach as house gardener. The offshoots of his daughters grew into vast and powerful houses in their own right, except for House Tyrell. We chose instead to serve our gardener cousins faithfully as stewards, to manage their stronghold of High Garden and the daily affairs of the Reach. Our words are growing strong. And under our stewardship, the Reach did just that, as did we, until a blundering king almost cost us everything. Aegon Targaryen had landed in Westeros. King Myrne allied us with the Roth to repel the upstart's army. One can only marvel that King Myrne did not reconsider when he saw the living dragons against him. Perhaps he should have sought counsel from his trusted stewards before he set out. Then again, perhaps he did. At the Field of Fire, Aegon, and let us not forget, his sisters, burnt the combined armies of the Reach and Rock. King Myrne paid for his misjudgment with his life and that of his ancient family. In a day, the Reach had lost its king, its ruling house, and most of its army. Thankfully for everyone, my ancestor, Harlan Tyrell, had better sense. Until the Maesters sorted out the intel among Myrne's cousins, Harlan the Steward was acting Lord of Highgarden. To ensure peace and life in the Reach, he would yield the castle to Aegon. The other castles and families would then follow, as they had since the Dawn Age. Aegon had a continent to conquer, and the fertile Reach was too valuable to raise. He accepted Harlan's proposal and welcomed our lands into his kingdom. To show his gratitude, Aegon entitled Harlan to Highgarden the castle his family had served for a thousand years, and made House Tyrell his wardens of the south, choosing us over older, greater families in the Reach. Our house thus owed everything to the Targaryens. So is it any wonder we stayed true to King Ares, even during his madness, and even after Robert Baratheon rebelled? Some may question my father for laying siege to the Baratheons' home, instead of marching to aid Prince Rhaegar before Robert could kill him and scatter the royal army. But let us not forget that we had already dealt Robert his only defeat of the war at Ashford. If Lord Tywin Lannister had not vanquished the Mad King so suddenly, our siege would have destroyed Robert's home and his brothers and won the war for Ares. But when the Targaryens fell, House Tyrell again chose peace and prosperity over war and devastation, and bent the knee to King Robert Baratheon, 
first of his name. We returned to Highgarden to manage the affairs of the Reach, as we had for thousands of years, and will for a thousand more. Other great houses take lions and wolves for their sigils, and draw their power from the gold in their mountains, or the cold of their winters. But mountains run dry. Winter yields to spring. And the rose blooms once more. Where the North has its honor and the South its chivalry, the Iron Islands has its strength. We call ourselves the Ironborn, and we are warriors feared throughout the Seven Kingdoms. Or so we used to be. Unlike their mainland cousins, the first men of the Iron Islands never bowed to the old gods. Theirs was the Drowned God, who made the Ironborn to reeve and sack and write their names in salt, steel and song, that his enemy, the Storm God, could not wash away. We raised our kings from our own ranks, and used beaten foes as thralls to work our mines and farm our land. Or as salt wives, if a woman was pretty enough. Such was the old way, and while we followed it, we held sway wherever the waves were heard. When Aegon came demanding fealty, King Harren the Black ruled as far east as the Trident. Other kings, like the Starks, could kneel, but Harren was ironborn and the Ironborn must be beaten. In Harren Hall, he had the mightiest castle in Westeros, and the army to defend it. But Aegon did not intend a siege. He mounted his dragon and roasted Harren and all his sons in their tower, and the old way with them. Because of Harren's defiance, Aegon pushed the Ironborn back to our islands and gave the Riverlands to the Tullys. But he did allow the Ironborn to choose who would lead them. House Greyjoy had always been one of the greatest houses of the Iron Islands. We trace our descent from the Age of Heroes and the legendary Grey King, who took a mermaid to wife and made war upon the Storm God for a thousand years. Blessed by the Drowned God, the Grey King fought and slew Naga, the great sea dragon, and took her fire for his own. This history made our ancestor, Vicon Greyjoy, the natural choice to lead the Ironborn after Aegon's conquest. For 300 years, House Greyjoy ruled the Ironborn. We styled ourselves Lord of the Iron Islands, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, Lord Reaper of Pike. In truth, we were thralls. Our people still chanted what is dead may never die. But the old way had died. Until the Targaryens followed their dragons into the grave, and our Lord Father, Balon Greyjoy, rose against the new king, Robert Baratheon. He seized our ancient crown and sent our iron fleet against the Lannisters at Lannisport, burning all their ships before any could weigh anchor. Though Robert and Eddard Stark would later defeat him, they understood us no better than Aegon. The Greyjoy sigil is the Kraken. What it grasps once, it will never surrender. What, what is, is dead, dead may, may never die, die but, but rises, rises again. again. Harder and stronger. Honor, glory, lies to make idiot boys want knighthood, and idiot girls spread their legs for it. Let me tell you what makes a knight. Killing. Either enough men, or the right man. House Clegane should know. We're very good at both. Most families claim some great ancestor so far back that nobody can prove them liars. Not us. My grandfather kept the kennel for Lord Titus Lannister of Casterly Rock, the father of Lord Tywin. Lord Titus was a weak man who didn't know it. One day while hunting, he stumbled on a lioness. Instead of embracing the man who wore her on his banners, she tried to tear out his throat. Lucky my grandfather came up with the dogs and drove the big cat away. As a reward, the Cleganes got lands and a keep and a son to squire for the Lannisters. We took the three hounds who died for them as our new sigil. When Tywin Lannister became Lord of Casterly Rock, he wanted more from his former kennel master than fealty. He bet the training hounds to kill 
isn't far from training boys to kill. In just two generations, my brother Gregor and I proved him right. I gutted my first man at 12. Years after, servants started disappearing in our keep, and even a sister I don't remember. But nobody could prove anything against Gregor, or dared if they caught him at it. For my father wanted a knight in our family, and thought he'd found one in Gregor, who at 13 towered over enough men that they called him the mountain. Sure, Gregor looks quite the champion from a distance, but a mountain can't cleave a man in half with one blow and won't break a wench's face if she talks. Through Lord Tywin's influence, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen kindly anointed my brother personally, a great honor for our family, everyone said. One year later, Sir Gregor shiverously sacked the prince's city brained the prince's baby, and raped and murdered the prince's wife, winning our family yet more honor from the new king and queen. Soon after, my father died, they say in a hunting accident. The same day that Gregor became lord of the Clegane lands, gold and anything under his roof, I left our home to take service at Castle Rock. Lord Tywin is not like his father, Neither is King Joffrey, or the likes of me would never be on the King's Guard, as all those true knights. Between them, a man who serves the Lannisters will never lack for killing. I'll guard this king, such as he is. Gregor will kill the other ones, such as he does. When we're done, we'll see how many people still believe in songs and fairy tales. A long time ago, they say, some old southern king enslaved our giants by magic and forced them to build your famous wall. Then he kicked all of my kind to the other side and raised an army to keep us there. And we're the uncivilized ones, wildlings. Might be Sir King was wise. Even a giant can be made to kneel, but only if he wants a better crack at your head. The Free Folk don't follow a man because his father tells us. If the King's son was brave and strong, aye, we'd follow him as we did his father. If he wasn't... But it seems to me, as much as the Wall keeps us out, it keeps you Southerners in. You follow laws you didn't make kneel to kings you didn't choose and pray to gods you never hear from. Our traders talk about your seven. Beyond the wall, the stars shine bright and clear. Any gods there aren't listening to the likes of men. Our gods are of the forest, in the trees that shelter us and the rivers that feed us. They gave the land for all of us to share. We fish, farm, and hunt where we will, when we need. If a man wants a woman, he has to prove he'll give her strong and cunning sons. Now it's easy. When she tries to slit his throat, he don't let her. With the Free Folk, you get what you can take, and you keep what you can hold. No more. I wonder... Even if my kind didn't hop over your wall, would he still set your night's watch to guard it? You Southerners are rich. You always have more steel, gold, and daughters. I think you're afraid. If you've always knelt, you don't know what freedom is. And if you've not been beyond the wall, you don't know what fear is. You will. Swords in the darkness. Aye. The Black Brothers of the Night's Watch are that, at least. As too many of the Free Folk know. You Southerners are strange. A man murders, and you train him to kill better. 
a man thieves or rapes, and you send him where it's dark and private. Or at least you make him promise to be good. Well, then you make him regret even that. From the time he's woken to the time he's allowed to sleep, he walks the frozen wall, carries frozen stones or boils frozen food. When he lies down at night, he can't have nobody to warm his frozen bed. Well, not unless the crows like to nest together. You think he remembers the stories they told him then? About when the White Walkers woke in the land of always winter, and how the wall and the night's watch were raised to stop them the next time. I never mind trapping us on the other side. We free folk have our stories too. About how one of your king crows found something cold in the woods with bright blue eyes. How he brought her home through your wall and declared himself Night's King. Thirteen years he and his queen ruled over his brothers, making sacrifices as black as their cloaks. Lucky for you, Southerners, the Free Folk rallied to a king beyond the wall, as we will when need be, and marched on the ancient castle he'd taken for his own, the Night Fort. With the help of the Starks, we killed the demon and cleansed your precious watch. And then they thanked us and kicked us back across the wall, as you always have. Gandal, Raymond Redbeard, the Horned Lord, each chosen as a king beyond the wall, each promising victory. And all falling to the Night's Watch and the Starks. But this time is different. Our new king knows your tricks. You called him a brother crow once, but you never forgot his wings. We know how you think. We know where you're weak. Watch for us from your wall if you like. With the cold, you won't even feel the blade slip into your back. Nobody knows why the Targaryens first came to the island of Dragonstone. Old Valyria was then at the height of its power and the center of a civilized world, which ended at the Narrow Sea. Westeros was a filthy backwater with seven kings squabbling over borders and minor glories. So much for progress. The island itself was and is nothing. It had no gold or gems to lure Valyrian nobility. All it has is rock. Mostly a shiny black stone, too brittle for war and too sharp for building. The Targaryens called it Dragonglass. I call it useless. But the Targaryens managed to raise a castle here. Simpletons claim they used ancient Valyrian sorcery, forgetting that the Targaryens brought a small army with them from Essos. There's no magic in strong backs, though admittedly the castle is unlike any in Westeros. Foreign and... strange. If the Targaryens ever regretted their barren outpost and longed for the comforts of home, the doom made their folly permanent. Valyria collapsed into the waves and was no more. To look east was to see the ruin of their homeland, the greatest civilization before or since. But to look west, as Aegon realized, was to see a fertile land ripe for conquest. Perhaps even a new Valyria. Though good for little else, Dragonstone was the perfect staging point for Aegon's invasion of Westeros. The Blackwater Bay granted easy access to the continent. The lands there were disputed by three kingdoms, the Reach, the Iron Islands, and the Stormlands. But their capitals were far enough away that none could mount a force before Aegon got a foothold, even if their kings had been able to stop bickering over whose problem he was. Then it was too late. Aegon had chosen his first camp well. With the bay to the east, the river to the south, and open fields to the north and west, his army would be impossible to take by surprise. A perfect site for an invasion, and one day, his capital city. King's Landing. The Doom had taught the Targaryens the prudence of refuge. After the conquest, Dragonstone became the seat of the Crown Prince and heir to the Iron Throne. 
It would serve them well, and me ill, 300 years later after my brother Robert Baratheon rebelled against the Iron Throne and the Lannisters slaughtered the mad King Aerys and his royal family. Robert dispatched me to deal with the last surviving Targaryen children. But before I arrived, a loyal knight smuggled them across the narrow sea to safety. Hatred for the Targaryens blinded Robert. Unjustly, I was blamed, and stripped of our family's castle of Storm's End, and given Dragonstone in its stead. Over the years, whenever I demanded my rights restored, Robert would remind me of the island's royal pedigree and pretend he was doing me honor. As if I were one of his tavern girls to be so easily deceived and dismissed. But Robert is dead, and I, Stannis Baratheon, am the rightful king of Westeros. Let the usurpers and traitors sit on the Iron Throne. From Dragonstone, I will be the dagger at their throat. On the shores of the God's Eye, due north of the Isle of Faces, rises a monument to arrogance and cruelty. Harrenhal. For a people who prided themselves on their ships, the Iron Men of old seized any chance to leave them, and carved out a vast kingdom from the peaceful river lords. Their empire reached its zenith under King Heron Hora, called the Black by those he terrorized, and by his own men, though they meant it proudly. King Heron enslaved the Riverlands to raise the mightiest fortress Westeros had ever seen. A castle that could garrison a million men, with walls so vast that winters would come and go, and besieging armies grow old and grey before the castle fell. Five towers he ordered, reaching into the heavens like grasping fingers. A monstrosity which he forced our people to build for their own subjugation. But the very day the slaves laid the last stone, Aegon Targaryen and his sisters arrived in the south. When they arrived with their small army, Heron laughed and shut the gates. Heron Hall would have its first test, and an easy one at that. It failed. Heron Hall could have withstood an assault from all the armies in Westeros combined. But Heron learned that the tallest and thickest walls meant little to dragons, for dragons fly. With Heron and his sons dead, Heron Hall quickly surrendered to Aegon. House Tully then raised the River Lords in rebellion against the Iron Islands, and with Aegon we flushed the Iron Men to the sea. We should have torn down the castle stone by stone then, but Heron Hall seemed such a magnificent prize that Aegon gave it to one of his commanders whose line then withered to extinction, as would every family to hold it thereafter. When many speak of Harrenhal, their voices drop to whispers about Mad Lady Lothson, who was said to send a giant bat to collect children for her crockpots, and to bathe in blood and serve feasts of human flesh about the ghosts of Black Heron and his sons who still walk the castle at night all aflame, of the servants who went to bed in full health and were found in the morning burnt to ash. Mere stories to frighten wayward children and excite young girls, you may say. You would not be entirely wrong. Heron Hall is a prize. A nigh impregnable castle with enough land and enough income to make a man at a stroke one of the greatest lords in Westeros. But you would not be entirely right either. Say by a king's grace, Harrenhal became yours. Now you must garrison it. You must repair it and maintain it. Even stretched to the ends of your means, you cannot fill and manage the whole castle. So you retreat your household to four of the five towers, then three, then two, then only the bottom thirds of those. You close the hall of a hundred hearths and take your meals in your rooms. Even then you can't shake the feeling of desolation, that Heron Hall and its vastness is devouring you. 
In later years, as you bury a grandson or a great-grandson, the last of your line, you will know it has. At its height, the Valyrian Freehold ruled over half the known world. Not bad for former shepherds, but the doom fell on them and sank their capital into the sea. Now Volantis is the ember of old Valyria, ensuring its flame does not go out from this world, as any Volantine will tell you. Pentoshi say the same about Pentos, Lysines about Lys, and so on. But after enough time in the nine free cities, it's hard to see them as anything but ashes of glory. Volantis is the oldest, the first colony of Valyria. After the doom, the Volantines tried to rebuild the empire under their rule. They failed. Not least because the last Valyrian with dragons, Aegon Targaryen, entered the war against them. Now they are content to dominate only their lower classes. Or so they say. Bravos is the strangest. A city erected not by the Freehold, but against it. A labyrinth of illusion and deceit to hide the refugees from Valyria's slave lords. After the Doom, the city emerged from the shadows to become one of the greatest banking centers in the world. A man can get anything in Bravos for a price. Especially death. Your own if you offend one of the swaggering swordsmen that pollute the city. Or if you're very rich or very desperate anyone else's. Lys is the easiest of the free cities, full of pleasure houses catering to every taste, no matter how peculiar. Many men lose themselves in Lys and are never found, at least alive. When a man runs out of coin, the Lysines may grant him their other speciality on the house, poison. Pentos is the most ruthless. The Magisters make a great show of choosing the Prince of Pentos from the great families and granting him the powers of trade, justice, and war, as long as he checks with them first. On the new year, to bring good fortune to Pentos, this prince must deflower the Maid of the Field and the Maid of the Seas. I confess I don't know how each is chosen or what becomes of them after serving their purpose. But if a crop should fail or a war be lost, the Magisters will slit the prince's throat and choose another. The other free cities are known for what they make. Mia has its lenses and finery. Norvos, its axes. Quohol, its smiths who can reforge Valyrian steel. Tyrosh, its colors. I'm sure Lorath had something to the world, but I can't think of it. Frankly, the nine of them are more alike than they would care to admit. They hire the same soldiers to fight the same wars for the same rulers, the rich, be they called magisters, archons, or what have you. When a Dothraki Kalasar approaches, they gift the same tribute to avoid the same sacking. For thousands of years, the disgraced of Westeros have drained east to pool in the free cities, where a man of honor counts for less than nothing unless it raises his price. Better men than I have learned that what a man sells for gold, he can never buy back. He must earn it by fire and blood. Carth has always and only belonged to the Carthine. We were never part of Valeria's empire, nor have we ever fallen to a Dothraki horde. Our walls and the red waste outside them guard us from such annoyance. Many call the approach to our city the Garden of Bones. It needs little tending to grow. Our city, however, would be quite a prize for any empire. Karth straddles two worlds, a greedy and curious west and a rich and mysterious east. The marvels of Yiti and Ashai pass through our markets and share births with the riches of the free cities and Westeros. Our ports have fulfilled many a trader's dreams, almost as many as they have broken. We call Karth the greatest city that ever was or will be, an easy claim to make if one knows only the docks and customs houses of other cities, an easy lie to swallow if a people see only the gold and jewels of their rulers. 
which we, the Thirteen who govern the city, are careful to ensure. The proud Carthine shook off the yoke of unjust kings long ago, so they are told at festivals by the Pureborn, the king's direct descendants who have controlled the Thirteen ever since. Only now, instead of scepters, they use ships. A merchant only remains on the Thirteen until the others are no longer afraid to deny him, or too afraid to deny his replacement. Except for the Warlocks, they alone hold a hereditary seat, a relic from when they had powers, or at least from when the world was younger and more easily duped. Over the years, we have developed an understanding with them. They shall always be welcome on our councils and at affairs of state, provided they never come. Rare is the civic problem that can be solved by cryptic nonsense and shade of the evening. Thankfully, they need little encouragement to confine themselves to their House of the Undying. Yet perhaps we Carthine are too confined ourselves. We feel safe behind our walls and our laws, which no visitor can hope to follow, and by which any citizen who vouches for a guest always pays with his life. But like a ship in the summer seas, a city grows becalmed without fresh wind. The greatest city that ever was or will be? An epitaph. I would prefer the greatest city that is. The Seven are gods of weakness and defeat. Pretty chains that the first men kindly put on after the Andals crushed them. Except in the Iron Islands. Since the Dawn Age, the Ironborn have followed the Drowned God, who plucked fire from the sea and made us to reeve and sack and carve our names in blood and song. When the Andals landed on the Iron Islands, they found a god who was father, warrior, and stranger, who took mother, maiden, and crone when he would, and held the smith in thrall. His priests are the Drowned Men, who are clothed and armed by the sea itself. They consecrate us to the Drowned God through our most sacred rite, the Drowning, and ask the God to raise us from the sea as he was, harder and stronger. The Ironborn do not fear the bloodiest battles or the roughest waves, for the Drowned God taught us long ago that what is dead may never die. When an Ironborn falls, we say the Drowned God needed a strong oarsman and took him below to feast in the God's watery halls, attended by mermaids. But even in death, an Ironborn is a warrior. We fight against the Storm God, who holds a castle in the clouds, and sends the winds to lure the Ironborn off course or wreck our ships. It's said my legendary ancestor, the Grey King, waged war upon the Storm God for a thousand years. With the Drowned God's help, he slew the great sea dragon Naga and used her bones for his hall. After his death, the Storm God tried to wash away any memory of this terrible foe, but his songs fill our halls to this day. It was the Storm God who first blew the Andals to the Iron Islands, to subdue us and turn us from our faith. True, they conquered and killed our king, but in time they forsook their septs for the shore and their fat septons for the drowned men. The Andals came to us as conquerors. In the end, they drowned. The Ironborn are of the sea, as our god made us, and given to it as our god taught us. We do not fear the storm god's winds or his waves, but you should, for they bring us to you. Dragons conquered the Seven Kingdoms, but to rule them, the Targaryens needed a less uh, temperamental tool. When the great King Magor saw the power of the Alchemist Guild, he blessed us with his patronage. In those days, we commonly transmuted metals and other wonders, but the King was most interested in our mastery of the substance which those not of our order dub wildfire. A slight misnomer. To the uninitiated, the substance indeed seems uncontrollable. Water will not extinguish it, nor plate of steel repel it. 
Our order alone knows its secrets. In bare stone cells beneath the guild hall, our acolytes prepare the substance with utmost care and ancient magic. Apprentices then remove the jars to a secure storage. Overseeing its purity are the wisdoms, such as myself, who are adept in the alchemical mysteries. Should an acolyte prove unworthy and allow the substance to ignite, the ceilings are spelled to collapse and fill the room with sand. For once lit, only smothering or starvation will quench the fire. Many years did the alchemist guild serve the Targaryens faithfully, until we were beset on all sides by the envious, the order of maesters, who dismissed all learning but their own, and the charlatans who hucked green paint and worse in our names. After the unfortunate Prince Arian Targaryen, drunk with wine, boasted that a draught of the substance would transmute him into a dragon, <laughs> we lost our royal favor. Then came the wise King Ares, second of his name. I was merely an acolyte when he restored our guild to its former glory. As had his great forefathers, he appreciated our secret arts even naming Wisdom Rossart as Hand of the King. Together, they punished his enemies as befits a true Targaryen. During the war of the Usurper, I heard whispers that King Ares had engaged our greatest wisdoms for an ultimate weapon against his foe. But sadly, King's Landing must have fallen before it could be used and many of our wisdoms disappeared in the sack of the city. Victims of ignorance and envy, as ever, I'd wager. Yet our order perseveres, like the substance which grows ever more potent as it ages, we perfect our ancient arts in darkness, forgotten by the world. We are masters of the fire, but we live only to serve. All we need is the right um, spark. The East is plagued with mystics who claim many dread powers but prove only one, separating the foolish from their purses. Not so with the renowned warlocks of Karth. They demand a much dearer coin in return for their parlor tricks. Respect. Once, the warlocks truly were mighty, or so they would have us believe. I do not doubt they have many secrets. They are an old order, and one does not obtain a seat on the Thirteen, the governing council of Karth, without making twelve of our most powerful citizens afraid to forbid it. Thankfully for Karth, the warlocks exert little influence in our politics. They rarely leave the confines of the House of the Undying, a pompous name, but I admit, a strange and dark tower. It is said that none who enter ever leave. Of course, since there are no visible doors, I have to believe none ever enter either. We can only imagine what the warlocks do inside. I wager we do not have to imagine much. They read dusty scrolls detailing their lost glory. They sip shade of the evening, a foul concoction brewed from the nearby trees until their lips turn blue, the better to frighten children and the ignorant. Stewing in their fantasies like an, an old soldier who drinks alone so no one may challenge their prowess. Whatever the warlocks may wish, their magic, like all magic, is dead in the world, if it ever existed. Though, one does hear strange whispers of late. Glass candles that have been cold for a hundred years, now burning. Ghost grass, found far from the lands of the shadow. A kalasar led by a woman with three heads. Traders nonsense, most likely. But should the warlock's vaunted magic ever return, that would be a dangerous day for Karth. I shall need to keep my eyes on them. Indeed.